Okay, we are going to be and we'd like to have everyone please close your eyes and take a nice big deep breath and let it all go. I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do because he who sent me will direct me. I am content to be wherever he wishes, knowing he goes there with me. I will be healed as I let him teach me to heal. Amen. All right, we've been practicing reviewing, I guess, uh, going over a section in text 62, uh, paragraph 1, and if you have an old book, it would be uh, page 57. And though we have gone through this section over the last couple of weeks, I wanted to recap a little bit of this before we go on. So paragraph one, if you cannot hear the voice for God, it is because you do not choose to listen. And I'll be honest with you, hearing those words when I first started with the course, I was like this, because really, I can't hear God's voice because I don't choose to listen, because from where I was sitting, it appeared to me that unequivocally I was desperately trying to listen and that I wanted to hear God's voice more than anything else. But I do remember one, one time uh, working on goals, as many of us have done throughout our lives. I don't lean in that direction much anymore, but at that time I did. And I remember writing my goals, and I started jotting them down, and then about maybe four or five goals in down, all of a sudden I was like, oh, that's right, I want to connect with God. And so I erased it there and put it up on the top. But if I was honest with myself, I would know that God wasn't my number one goal because I didn't put him number one. I stuck him in number one maybe, but I didn't really put him in number one. And basically, what this line means is, if I've chosen for the ego, I am choosing against the voice of God. And why would I choose for the ego? We chose collectively as one son for the ego because we wanted to be in charge. Uh, God gave us everything. He gave us love and joy and peace, connectedness, oneness. The only thing that God could not give us was to be the creator. God was the creator. All the other attributes we shared with God except for that one. Somewhere deep within us, we decided we wanted to be in charge. So basically what we were saying is we wanted to be God. At that moment, we had that tiny mad idea that's depicted here by this little green V, the tiny mad idea. And as the Course describes it, it's the tiny mad idea where the Son of God remembered not to laugh. Because when we had that tiny mad idea, what we basically were saying is, I want to be different than what God created or how he made me. So when we went from here to here, we literally closed the door to the memory of this and began to choose this. Now, the first step after that was that the Holy Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit that said, but nothing happened. We looked at these two choices, and we still wanted to be an individual, special, different, and the creator. So we looked at these two choices, plus the fact that now I believe, because I left God, that he's not going to be too happy with me. And I didn't trust going back to him, even though the Holy Spirit was given to us to remind us of that. We chose this, took it seriously, and since then have lived from this part of our mind. We then had all this guilt, sin, and fear within us, and we tried to solve the problem of how to get rid of it. And the way we decided to get rid of it was to project it into the world. So we projected a me and everything else. 
and it, it's shown, we often talk about it being our brother, but it literally is absolutely everything that is seemingly outside of us, even our own physical body. So we dump that all right in here, and now we're an innocent victim of something else outside of me, and I get to be an innocent victim, have a perpetrator, and will remain separated as that innocent victim and I don't have to go back to God I can remain as the individual special and different but then blame it on somebody else which is all good and fine the only trouble is there's always going to be a perpetrator and for the most part we're going to complain about the fact that we have a perpetrator and be aware that a perpetrator can be in, in any type of irritation upset disruption uh, anyone who stimulates anger in you, it is literally anything that can take your peace away. So these situations, people, circumstances keep popping up in our life. That's a real serious problem. Plus, we will seek and not find what we're really questing from, which is that connection with the love of God. So it, it was kind of a lose-lose situation. But we do have the opportunity to be in charge, to be basically God, because we literally kicked God off the throne and we took over as our own creator, our own uh, problem solver, and we've continued down that road ever since. Um, you know, it was explained that from here on was the big, from the Big Bang on is always it's been lived in this specific scenario or this situation so when this says if you cannot hear the voice for god it is because you do not choose to listen well the only way i can choose to listen is first of all to know that god's there which is a big part of what the course is trying to help us understand and i have to be willing to drop my investment in everything that the ego is and has to say and what it represents in order to hear the voice for God. So I have to let it all go. And most of us aren't quite at a place where we're willing to completely do that. So Jesus basically says, you don't have to let it all go right now. Just in those moments that you're very challenged, are you willing to let it go? Just for a moment, even if you grab it back again. And Jesus would specifically say, guess what, guys? This is the only plan that's ever going to work. Take all the time you want to try to figure it out on your own. But unfortunately, it's never going to work. And the reason it's never going to work is because we're always looking for the answer where it doesn't belong. It is only when we drop this that we can access this and find the answers that we're really questing and looking for. So if you cannot hear the voice for God, it is because you do not choose to listen. Now, Jesus seems like he's not being very nice to us because he is putting this in our face. What do you mean I've chosen not to hear what you have to say? And yet, he knows that this is accurate information, and he knows what a struggle it is for us to grasp this. And he also knows how difficult it is to even move beyond this, though it's very simple. You're either aligned with the ego or you're aligned with the Holy Spirit. But since we're so addicted to the ego, it's very challenging for us to be willing to completely let go of our attachments to everything we've ever known, everything we've ever experienced, to you know, grasp for this something that to us appears like a nothing. And as some people often say, it's like, well, being in heaven would be boring because we're so used to the chaos of our life experiences. And certainly our life experience has just dimensions and dimensions and dimensions of possibilities of ways of which we can be pulled into the illusion. And you want me to drop all of that and go home and be with you? and especially drop 
this is Character Called Me, which is something I'm not at all thrilled or excited about dropping because it's my identity. It's who I think I am. It's how I operate in the world. It's how I make, some, make choices, how I do things, how I accomplish things in the world. And you want me to let that go so I can find out what you have to say? But as we begin to be challenged in ways that we know we can't figure it out on our own, and we have attempted to figure it out on our own in so many ways, and we become aware that all my ways of figuring it out have fallen very short. Then we begin to be willing, even if it's only for a moment, to ask to see it through his eyes instead of our eyes. And that's what he wants, that little willingness, that moment where we can choose to connect with him and as we begin to do that we slowly align with this and we get less and less power or investment in this and then eventually just like this is the overriding storyline it's the automatic we have to literally you know pick up our you know drop this pick up the pieces and walk over here but eventually this will be the automatic and this will begin to be the less than automatic experience. So he goes on to say that that you do listen to the voice of your ego dem is demonstrated by your attitudes, your feelings, and your behaviors. So what does this mean? What, he, what it means is if I choose for this, this is going to happen. So he's asking us to look at our world, look at how we experience our world. Am I afraid? Am I irritated? Do things bother me? Do people bother me? Does my body falling apart? Really look at all the ways of which the world is telling us, it's demonstrating as this is, by the attitudes and the feelings that I experience. And if they're not peaceful, joyful, and coming from a place of oneness. This is telling of what is in charge. Now, somebody in the class did ask a question, and the question was, you know, did God set this all up for us so that we'd have these challenges so that we would learn and grow and go back to who we are? And though the course would parallel that to some degree. It's very specific in the concept that we made this choice to separate. And nothing from here over has anything to do with God. God is over here. He's always over here. And he's always constant. And he's always um, the same. It is only from here on where shift and change and growth and you know, all that lives. So we're literally working on learning how to drop the story of the ego, which will then take us over to the Holy Spirit. But to say that God set this up or the Holy Spirit set this up for our own good, I guess you could say, would not be aligned with what the Course is saying. In fact, it would say the opposite. Um, it, it talks about the idea that we chose the to hide in the ego world, and the ego world is literally an attack on God, and, it, and it's an attack on God because it really represents the total opposite of what God is and what God represents. So it's important to recognize that God did not set this up. He did not want us to grow. He wants us to go home, but we will not have that be experienced in the way that many spiritualities do discuss and explain it. Now the Course does say that this is what the ego set up, but as we begin to learn the Course, understand the Course, and live the Course, we will take what the ego set up but use it for a different purpose. Instead of using it as a purpose of attacking my brother so that I can remain the innocent victim and that I can pull off this game of I, um, I'm right and you're wrong and I can prove that you're wrong and I will use my story to prove that about you. The Course would say drop all that but do use 
the fact that your brother, your body, any other situation in your world can trigger the awareness that you have lost your peace. So that becomes the, the foundational story of the of practic, practice of this story. Is my peace been taken away? And unlike the world, the Course is very specific with you're either at peace or you're not at peace. And it absolutely does not make any difference of what causes your peace to be taken away. If you've lost your peace, you're in the ego. And I think initially, especially, I know I struggled with this, um, if you take the shootings in the school system this, this past week or so, and then you parallel that with, oh, I broke my fingernail and I'm now lacking peace because of my fingernail. Those seem like worlds apart, and how could you possibly, in a million years, compare these two? A fingernail, who cares? This, this is serious, this is vital, this is important. But the Course is trying to whittle this down to you're either at peace or you're not at peace. And if you're not at peace, it hasn't got anything to do with what's on the news or if you broke your fingernail. This was simply a trigger. And now we use that trigger to remind us, oh, that must mean I've chosen for the ego. And now that I'm aware that there's another choice, which is the Holy Spirit, I can choose that when I'm ready. And literally Ken often said one of the most important aspects of this course is that we now know we have another choice. See, before we lived our whole life in this box. And in this box, there was really no way out. We chased our tail a lot, and as the Course said, seek but do not find, but we really couldn't access the healing or the place of healing that would re be required for us to remember who we are. So all this time, we've been running around, keeping very busy, keeping in control and doing things our own way, but we have always been doing it from the box of which it's about seek but do not find because the answer doesn't lie there. And that's tricky because there are things we can do or have done in the world that seem to have brought effects that appear like it's a better situation. Perhaps I, um, you know, get a new job. And for a while I think, oh wow, this is much better than it was before. But some form of separation, guilt, sin, and fear will present itself in another place. Or I might lose 10 pounds and I go, yay, I've lost my 10 pounds. But then you're always thinking about food. So there's always a downside to every upside with the ego concept. Oops, just lost our light there. Let's see what we can do here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, let's see how that looks. Okay, that looks pretty good. So there's always a downside when we're playing in the ego world, and it never takes us to total peace. It may make the scenario a little bit more comfortable, but it doesn't heal it. And we know with the amounts of addictions that are available on the planet, you know, smoking, drinking, shopping, work, being a workaholic, doing whatever. It keeps our mind busy and we keep, keep moving and churning, but it doesn't really take us to healing. And, you know, that cigarette may be great, but then I have to have another one later, or that piece of chocolate cake, divine. But then, again, tomorrow I want another. It's like I get filled up, but I don't get completely filled up because nothing of this world can completely fill me up. And that's another aspect of the Course that we're trying to get an understanding of. Yes, there are good things in the world, there's fun things in the world, and yes, I'd rather go to the movie than go to work maybe, but it doesn't fill me as truth fills me because nothing can replace the truth. And truth does not exist in separation. Not there. One or the other. 
and in order to access this, I have to be willing to let this go. All right, so we're going to move on to paragraph number two on, on page 66, 62 in the text. All right, so Jesus says, when your mood tells you that you have chosen wrongly, and this is so, whenever you are not joyous, then know this need not be. So what? <laughs> so when you're never, when you are, whenever you are not joyous, and what is joyous? Being totally at peace with no matter what happens in the world. It doesn't mean I put a smile on my face because I'm at a picnic and this is fun. It means I'm totally in a place where nothing can take my peace away. And personally, I think that's quite a mountain that I want to get to the top of. So, literally, our world then becomes our classroom. As you see, this is a mindless um, excuse me, the classroom. Yeah, classroom is over here because when we begin to use this as our classroom and we begin to hone in on those moments when anyone, anything, or any circumstance can take my peace away and I remember, oh, that's right, that has to mean it's not about them, but it's about the fact that I've chosen for the ego instead of the peace and love of God. And now I can do something about it. So literally my classroom becomes, my world becomes my classroom that I can practice this in. <clears throat> and when the Course talks about the idea of when we are aligned with the ego, and as you can see this is tinted, when we're aligned with the tinted we cannot see clearly what is really there. And so Jesus makes reference to the idea of the darkened glass. We're, we're living in an experience with the darkened glass when we choose for the ego. He goes on to say, uh, all right, so in every case you have thought wrongly about some, bro about some brother God created and are perceiving images your ego makes in a darkened glass. So what Jesus is saying is literally Whenever your mood is not fully joyous, it's because you're holding an unforgiveness towards a brother, a situation, yourself, or, or any aspect of that. Because you have decided your brother is something other than what God created him to be. Powerful statement. Something we need to ponder upon. Something we need to eventually put into practice in our world. Because if I am holding thoughts against my brother, I am thinking differently than God, and I'm aligning with the ego. And it doesn't matter if it's thoughts about yourself. I mean, we're really good at that, aren't we? You look in the mirror, oh, I don't like this, I don't like that, I don't. But if you think about it, all those thoughts that bring you lack of peace in regard to yourself, are always thoughts about your body or what your body does or what your body accomplishes or what your body doesn't accomplish. It, it has nothing to do with God and your relationship with him and how he created you, which has nothing to do with the body, which of course is quite the challenge because what do we associate with 98.99%? My body in the influence, in the influx, in my relationship to the world and my body. So it's very difficult for us to suddenly, you know, to start out being totally enmeshed in our body and being introduced to this idea of, I'm not the body, but who am I? What am I? And then continue to live in a world where I have to play the part and the role of being in the body being the body, I shouldn't say in the body. So it is not an easy process at the beginning stages. It does become easier as we continue to practice, as we continue to move forward in this. But initially it takes a lot of getting, you know, a lot of practice to get to the point where I don't completely identify with myself as my body. But every time I ask for help, every time I ask for healing, 
I mean literally investing more in that concept and less and less with this concept because at any given moment I'm here or here I can't be both of these at one time and I can only access one at this moment and literally this is the only moment that healing can occur if I have thoughts of the future and fear or I have thought regrets from the past all the same can't find that space I have to clear out and you know we talked a couple weeks ago about the idea of the Zen monk that comes in and he has a cup of water and gives it to this guest and then he starts to pour water into that cup well the, it just drools all over the side because you can't fill a cup that's already full well our cup of thinking what we think we know is pretty full and we literally have to empty that cup leave the space for that cup in order for the new to come in and I think even in the Bible it said you can't put fresh wine in old skins it, it doesn't work you have to come clear completely clean let go of what we think we know and we think we know a lot and Jesus says no you don't really don't know anything because what you think you think is coming from your ego mind and that's not the truth of who you are only the capital T truth or love is where truth and our connection with what oneness really is can be accessed. He goes on to say, think honestly what you have thought that God would not have thought and what have you thought that God would have you think? Well, huh? Well, again, what's that? But what God would have thought is love because it's the only word in that dictionary and how frequently do we miss the opportunity to see our brother through love or at least desire to see our brother through love because we get pulled into the storyline of I gotta fix my brother because he's the problem when in truth he's not the problem the problem or the cause lies here and as long as we're trying to fix it down here we're we're not accessing what we really need to access to bring that to healing so when we're literally dropping our story we're then saying okay Holy Spirit fill that space with your experience and you know in that first line that we read it talked if you cannot hear the voice for God then it's because you do not choose to listen. I think it's really important to realize hearing the voice for God does not necessarily mean, in fact, Ken would often even go so far as to caution people who were hearing voices from God because oftentimes that can be your ego stepping in and playing games with you. But when you empty that space, you're taking the storyline of the ego out of the way, and it's an empty space. But be very aware, we're very addicted to chaos, confusion. So an empty space is kind of frightening for us for the most part. We don't, we're not familiar with this space. We're, we're very familiar with the chaos of our life experiences. And I don't have it today, but we have our our hero of the dream chart, which is, you know, I'm the center of attention and there's stuff going around me all the time. One side is positive seemingly and one's negative, but the answer is not found in either of those. And yet there's so many ways the world can draw us in. And the only answer that is provided from the Holy Spirit is nothing happened which is not at all helpful or comfortable, comforting to me when I think I have a problem in the world and I think I need to find the answer to that problem so that I would be okay. Never does it occur to us that the problem isn't what's going on in the world. The problem is what's going on in my mind. And if I become aware that I've lost my peace and I begin to recognize that's because I've chosen for the ego instead of the Holy Spirit. 
and I begin to choose the Holy Spirit more and more frequently, it's going to be as though it's raining down into the world the place of sameness, forgiveness, hope, versus guilt, sin, and fear, suffering, and pain that is the rain that comes from the choice for the ego. So as we choose more and more, the reflection of that love will begin to be shared and experienced in the world. But it's a tricky, tricky thing because if I choose, if I recognize I've chosen wrongly and I choose for the ego, sometimes I will have an effect in the world and I'll go, yay, like it, let's do some more of that. But if I am literally looking, doing this because I want the result to look a certain way, then I'm losing the purpose of the shift. So I always say, recognizing that this is coming from here and asking to see it differently is the chocolate cake. Keep doing that. And if you get a reflection in the world that is pleasing to you, that's the frosting on the cake. And enjoy the frosting on the cake. But if you get lost in the frosting and you think you need the frosting to prove to you that you're doing this right, then you've lost the mark. And you're going to spend more time trying to, trying to get the effect that you're looking for instead of working on the cause of dropping the story of the ego to connect with the Holy Spirit. And then you just let what happens is really basically none of your business. And there's actually a, a section, and I think it's the teacher's manual that goes into it. If you really trusted God, you would know that everything would work out perfect, and it wouldn't matter to you how long it took or how it transpired if you totally trust it. Well, most of us don't trust to that degree. But as we progress through this and begin to use this process and begin to see the reflection of love, even if that reflection is simply an inner recognition of a more peaceful state on a more regular basis, you will know that it's working, even if there are no reflections of that peace, love, and calm in your world. But it is interesting, though, because sometimes you may ask and ask and ask and ask and ask and there's no frosting on your cake for a long time. And then you may go through a week where it's like being going ice skating on a beautiful, clear, smooth pond and everything just flows. And then you might re-dunk into the ego, but you will have had that experience of that peaceful glow, I'm going to call it, um, for lack of a better w word. And in fact, there's a, a section or a workbook lesson where it basically says that as you connect more, your brow becomes less frayed, proud, and, and it's you just begin to become more peaceful and you don't, things just don't grab you the way they used to grab you. And I think this is a rather gradual process, so you, you sometimes think, well, this isn't working. But if you look back at, you know, a couple of years back and you realize, wow, I know if this situation had happened to me today, five, you know, two years ago, I would have responded in a totally different manner. But it doesn't mean that the classrooms don't continue to show up. Someone in the class said, well, you know, I've been working on this for 30 years and, you know, I'm just starting to feel like I'm catching on a little bit more. But we have to understand that this choice was made at the Big Bang. And we've been carrying this around and reinforcing it over and over and over and over and over. And so 30 years of practice is absolutely fantastic and excellent and you should continue on that direction. But if you get challenged by the ego, just know that it is just doing its thing. It's doing what we literally invited it to do, which was to reinforce itself so that we would continue to align with the ego. Only we're getting a little bit smarter now. We're not allowing that to run the show as it did before. So be gentle with yourself. Be kind with yourself. Take the information that the Course is presenting. Recognize it, but don't add guilt to it. 
don't think, oh, wow, I'm doing this all wrong, and I've done this all wrong since the Big Bang. We all collectively did this, so don't go there. Simply start to recognize, ah, I recognize I've lost my peace. Help. And the more quickly that you can shift that to help instead of, oh, this person's an idiot, and, there's a, and the story that comes with every scenario that our life is presented with. And it's, it's as though you don't get pulled in so far and you don't stay there nearly as long. But that's not about denial. It's not about pretending it's not upsetting you. Really challenge yourself to stay in the issue that's being presented and really recognize, I want this. And that's an important aspect. Because when we chose for separation, we wanted to play the part of an innocent victim. Though I complain about being an innocent victim all the time on some level, there's part of me that absolutely loves it because I can't be, the, I have to have a perpetrator to be an innocent victim. And I say I don't want the perpetrator, and again, the perpetrator is anything, anyone, any circumstance that takes your peace away. But um, literally, on some level, I not only want the perpetrator there, I need the perpetrator to help me play the part of an innocent victim. But when I grow very tired of this scenario and I realize I don't want this anymore, I'm more willing to drop this to be shown a different answer that has nothing to do with this because this is not working for me anymore. Yes, I'm an individual, I'm special. Oftentimes in scenarios, I believe I'm right and the other person's wrong. But do I really know what's going on? And we know from workbook lesson number five, I'm never upset for the reason I think. I think I'm upset for this specific thing that presents itself today. But in truth, all that is is triggering that I've chosen wrongly and I'm not at home with the love of God. And eventually, the choice to be at home with the love of God becomes much more appealing. And we will want to choose for that more and more frequently because we like the peace and the stillness that we um, could not experience in the chaotic word, world of the ego. All right, so I'm going to read that line again. Think honestly what you have thought that God would not have thought and what you have not thought that God would have you think. So again, am I thinking outside of the thought of love? And, you know, let's face it, guys, that's like 98% of the time of our experience. But don't feel bad about that. Simply become aware, wow, look at that. Look at how I'm so enmeshed in my ego that I totally even forget to think that what I really want is the connection with that love that's always there waiting for me to come back to. So don't attach any guilt to the recognition of what this is trying to tell us, but do use it as a catalyst to move forward. He then says, search sincerely for what you have done and left undone accordingly, and then change your mind to think with God's. So again, and I think it's workbook lesson one, or excuse me, workbook lesson 23, where it has a three-step process. Step one is to recognize you have lost your peace, but understand that we wanted our peace to be lost so that I could continue playing this game. And step two is, I realize I don't want to pay that price anymore. And step three, and that would be to recognize this, and step three, the unfolding of that is what the Holy Spirit or Jesus has in store for us, which is not any of my business, literally. And that will be presented as I go through step one and step two. But be aware, we wanted this to play the game of separation the innocent victim role. Though both these characters are really coming from the same mind. 
This may seem hard to do, but it's much easier than trying to think against us. And basically what that means is we work very hard to uphold the ego thought system. It's hard work, but we don't know that letting go of it is to our advantage. And when we do that, we don't have to be God anymore. God takes over and it becomes a much smoother ride as we become aware, accustomed to that, and are willing to drop our story to find out what that is. Your mind is one with God and be aware that that's always correct. Your mind is one with God. But I can see faces in um, the Zoom meeting but I can cover them up. The faces are there but if I cover them up I can't access them, I can't see them, I can't experience them. The only way I can is to remove the blocks. And removing the blocks is to remove the story so it can be replaced by his story. <clears throat> Denying this, <clears throat> excuse me, and thinking otherwise has held your ego together but has literally split your mind. So we can play the hide-and-go-seek game and unequivocally confirm I can't see the light or we can take the blinders off and be shown what the light is. But when we play the game that we've been playing, we literally created a split mind. There was truth, which was, is always the only thing that's true and, and, and um, real, but we can play the part of accepting this is my reality and when I accept this as my reality I can't access what is my birthright but we also have to factor into that what was the value of me choosing against the love of God I can be in charge I'm an individual and I'm special in oneness that doesn't exist and as long as I want this to any degree it really represents, I don't want this. But again, this is not being told to us to make us feel bad. It's being made, told to us or made aware to us so that we can recognize, oh, is that really what I want? Do I want to prove my brother wrong so that I can look like I'm the good guy? And the question always has to be, what do I want more than anything else? And a couple of weeks ago, I passed out the little compasses. And, you know, if I revert to guilt, sin, fear, attack, judgment, or any other aspect of the, of the dream, other than choosing for peace, I'm literally saying, I don't want peace. Let me have some of this other. So again, we're becoming brutally aware of what the ego has to offer us and begin to question, do I want to play in this arena or do I want to choose for peace? And the, and the response to that question is always up to me. Somebody else, you know, sometimes people will say to me, well, do you know anybody that got this? And I always answer, you know, it really doesn't matter if somebody else got it. Yes, it's nice to have someone to look up to, but am I at peace? And I can search the world for people that got it, but what about me getting it? When that becomes, when that peace becomes my priority, then I'm willing to let go of all the rest of it to accomplish that. And, you know, it's really no different than someone on a diet. You can say you want to go on a diet or quitting smoking or any of those kinds of things. You can say you want that, but do you really want that more than anything else? And are you willing to hold firm in the midst of absolutely, positively anything that pulls you away? And unfortunately, the ego has so many ways that it can pull us into the world. And the only answer that the Holy Spirit has to offer is nothing happened. So it's not really very ego-friendly. It's undoing the ego-friendly, but not the ego-friendly. And as long as I'm identified with my ego, it's not going to happen that way. All right, let's...
let's see, as a loving brother, I am deeply concerned with your mind and urge you to follow my example as you look at yourself and at your brother and see in both the glorious creations of a glorious father. Now this makes it sound a little bit like you look at your brother and you go, okay, let's see, how can I superimpose God's face over my brother? And that's not really what's being asked of us. It is being, what is being asked is to drop the story that you've put over the face of God. And what is the story you put over the face of God? All the aspects of the ego. This is not your true identity. This is your true identity. And if you allow any of those to pull you in, it's just representing that you're too afraid of the love of God. And somebody in the class commented on how she was doing really well, you know, putting these principles into practice. Great, wonderful. But don't be surprised if you can go along for some time and then you slip and fall into the trap of the ego again. And it's really easy to then judge yourself, attack yourself, um, go into that whole deal instead of, oops, I blew it, get back on track. Oops, I blew it, get back on track. And not add anything else other than get back on track in your formula of stepping forward. And be very gentle and kind with yourself because we have been doing this since the Big Bang. It doesn't disappear overnight. But every time you take a little crack of that, a little bit of that iceberg is falling away and melting away. Another comment somebody made in class was someone who shared that his father had passed away this week. And as many of us, a difficult situation to walk through from the perspective of our world. You know, here's this individual who's been a part of my life since my birth, literally, or even before, I guess, I bet your father, um, and suddenly he is no longer a part of the deal. And this individual made the comment that he basically, it occurred to him, what's the use? Why bother? Why should I continue on with, with all this silliness of the world. And um, somebody that he knew who's working on the course as well challenged him and said, you know, are you are you using this as an excuse to not step forward in your spiritual journey? And certainly we can all use many cards in the world that say, I'm not going there anymore. This isn't worth it. I'm done. Life's too hard. Life is too challenging. I don't want to work on this. This is too much. And of course, for some, that can be the answer, but that's not the answer we're being asked to work through. The answer we're being asked to work through is to walk through this. And yes, it's a challenge. You know, my husband always uh, comments that dying's easy, but living, oh, living is a challenge because I have to keep stepping into the undoing process of my ego. And the only way I do that is to recognize what my ego's been up to and work towards dropping the storyline to find out who I really am. All right, so let me go back to this last line that we read. As a loving brother, I'm deeply concerned with your mind and urge you to follow my example as you look at yourself and at your brother. So Jesus is saying that he's concerned with our mind. He's not saying I'm concerned with all the stuff that's happening in your world. He's concerned with your mind because your mind has been so addicted to choosing for the ego, we didn't even know that that was a problem. And he's asking for us to align with what he did to heal his mind. And the course is really based on that step-by-step -step process and, uh, of undoing that we need help with because we're so addicted to the ego. And he goes on to say, and see in both the glorious creations of a glorious father. So as we begin to 
em allow that empty space to form that it's not filled with all my I think I know of the fear of the future or the concern of what I should I've done in the past if that's not filling that space and there's now an empty space then the awareness of the glorious creation that we are that our brother is will come to light because we've allowed that space to be filled by his answer instead of by our answer and once again the course is trying to help us understand what the ego is all about and i know many people frequently ask the question I don't get why we talk so much about the ego, so much about what quote unquote feels like it's negative. And the Course is always trying to help us understand what the ego is about, what it's up to, and why we chose it, and how we can rectify that choice at this time. Um, and one of the, I would say, foundational phrases in the Course is um, the Course is about remove the blocks to the awareness of love. Well, if I don't know what the blocks are and I don't know why the blocks have been placed there, then I can sit here and, and talk about love forever. But I won't remove those blocks to access the truth of what God's creations really are because I'm so enmeshed in the effects of the choice against what that love is. So I think we're going to stop at this point and we will say our closing prayer. So please take a nice big deep breath and let it all go. Forgive us our illusions, Father, and help us to accept our true relationship with you in which there are no... <laughs> where none can ever enter. Our holiness is yours. What can there be in us that needs forgiveness when yours is perfect? The sleep of forgetfulness is only the unwillingness to remember your forgiveness and your love. Let us not wander into temptation, for the temptation of the Son of God is not your will. And let us receive only what you have given, and accept but this into the minds that you created and which you love. Amen. I hope everybody has a wonderful week. See you next time.